Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, my name is Addie DeCandle, and I'm the um, Food Literacy Advisor for Farm to School BC. Um, we are having our webinar today. I'm just going to get this in full screen. Um, about soil seeding and um, how to do this in school gardens. So we are hearing from Pablo Vimos today, um, but before we get started, I just want to let everybody know about Farm to School. And I want you to think about, just take a moment, I know we all have busy lives right now, but if you just sit and take a moment and think about how it feels to get your hands in the dirt and the cool, um, dirt and how it feels alive. That soil is full of microorganisms and life and keeping that soil healthy is so important for our plants as we know. Um, but it, it's a really sensory experience. So I want you to just take a second and think about um, that feeling of joy that you get when you get to put your, your bare hands into the soil. And then thinking about that joy how do we, this is why we're all here. We're, we're having these experiences for our children, for, um, for their futures and for our futures and creating resiliency in the um, youth of today and being able to grow their own food. So that's why we're here. So Farm to School BC um, is a program administered by the Public Health Association of BC and we're supported by the province of British Columbia and the Provincial Health Services Authority. Uh, our programs are based on three pillars. You can see in the icon on the left there, healthy local food, hands-on learning, and school and community connectedness. And we have six regions spread across the uh, province. So right now we are uh, being hosted by Claudia Baez. Uh, she's the community animator in the Surrey region. Um, and we provide grants um, through our programs to schools. So since 2007, we have funded 211 schools in our most recent grant cycle. We had an estimated of 16,000 schools uh, participated in the program. So we have been able to interact with a lot of students across the province. Uh, just some housekeeping, you notice this webinar is being recorded. If you do not want your um, face to be on the recording, please keep your cameras off. Um, the recording will be posted on YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel, and linked through from our website. Um, as Pablo goes through his presentation, there's kind of going to be sections, and after each section, we'll, you can ask uh, questions. So you can just write your question in the chat, and then Claudia is going to go through and um, ask them to Pablo. If you have any further questions, wow, not sure why there's so many spaces in there, sorry. If you have any other questions afterwards, um, Pablo said that he's willing to, um, or not willing to, happy to um, answer any questions that you have. And you will receive the slides um, and Pablo has some great resources too that he's gonna share the link for. Um, and of course, the recording of the, this presentation. So we're going to do a quick survey because we want to know all about you. I'm just going to pull it up. So if you could let us know where you're from, what your role is, and what you are hoping to learn from today. I'm just going to end the polling so it doesn't take up too much time. Um, let me share these. Um, so where are you from? There's people from um, the Lower Mainland, Sunshine Coast, Vancouver Island, the interior, 
we have teachers, parents and guardians, community members, and other people on the phone, on the call today, and lots of people interested in soil care, square foot gardening, and school garden resources, which is wonderful. Because we are going to be talking about all of those things today. Um, I am going to pass it over now to Claudia so she can do our speaker introduction. Um, and she is the uh, community animator for the Surrey region. And she's also going to do uh -oh, <laughs> the territory acknowledgement. Uh oh, it be turned on the piano. Okay, go ahead, Clau. Thank you so much, Adi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, yeah, I am joining you from the unceded and ancestral territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tewatu people here in the also known um, Vancouver, city of Vancouver. Um, my personal pronouns are she and her. And as Adi said, um, I am the community animator for Surrey region. Um, this is a pleasure to be co-facilitating this um, webinar uh, in a very sunny day. Um, and today, our main speaker is Pablo Vimos. Um, Pablo is an organic master gardener and landscape ecologist uh, with a full passion uh, for urban agriculture. And I will not say anything else, um, nothing else, because I will leave Pablo to introduce himself. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Go to you, Pablo. Pablo, you are you are mute. I'm muted. Okay, yeah. And now All we right. are waiting Sorry for your that. slide. No worries. I will let you know when we have your slide. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. good to go. Yeah, thank you. All right to go. All right. Hello, everyone. And my name is Pablo Vimos. And I'm glad to be today sharing some of my experience in gardening. I, I have a background in agronomy and landscape ecology. And I'm a garden educator. And I have my own company called Roots to Grow. And uh, as well, I work with other companies like Earth Bites, and as well, I am the garden coordinator of Embark Sustainability, which is an SFU not-for-profit uh, organization led by students for students. So all the experience that I'm going to share with you today is based on working at the schools and as well at SFU with SFU students. Um, so let's start. Um, all the resources that I have created in this web link uh, if you would like to copy this, and uh, in that side, you will find all the handouts. I have prepared a handout for you. It's in there. You can download. I have some resources, some of my experiences, and as well, there are some at the end of the, the links are a few books that I, I use for doing some gardening. All right, so let's start. How do you garden? There are, wow, there's lots of things. So let's start with, uh, here I am assuming that most of the schools, or most of you are familiar with uh, raised beds. So which of these kind of beds do you use? Uh, I'm familiar with these three types of beds since I work with the school, Vancouver School District and with the Bonaville School District. So I'm familiar with the wooden frames, which is very nice because they just, is a, a frame that sits on the ground and when it rains, the water just drains free. The galvanized steel uh, house troughs, they are used by the Bournemouth School District. And these are uh, closed containers. So when it rains, uh, we have to make sure that the drainage is open so, so the water doesn't collect. And I have also opportunity to work with the self-watering garden beds. Um, and these have the similar a similar way. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, so the self-watering uh, beds, I have worked on them in, 
in Vancouver, and as well, needs some um, caring, uh, different caring. So all these garden beds have a different care. So the next is what is your planting style? Are you a traditional row planting? Are you a square foot gardening? More of um, organized and neat and biodiversity and quite dynamic? Or just you like to make your own seeds blend and just sprinkle over your garden and let it grow? That's what we call the wild planting. Pablo, it's it's a little bit choppy for people. There's something different with the internet today. Yes, I'm finding the same over here. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll, and the next is, are you, which kind of gardener are you? Are you a one-season gardener, or are you a year-round gardener? So that would give us a profile of which kind of gardener you are. You are. Okay, so here is my profile. I am an organic garden, growing vegetables on, on raised beds, using the square foot gardening and year round. So that's me. I'm sure each of you will have a different um, type of gardening, and um, yeah, that would like if you can share uh, your views through the chat. But, all right, so the school garden, based on my experience, um, in the schools, in the garden, we deal with lots of life cycles, life cycle of a plant, the life cycle of the aphids, the life cycle of the cutworm and earworms, and the garden itself is an ecosystem, a living ecosystem, and therefore has a garden a cycle. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, all right, and then so in this um, cycle, we will be talking about soil preparation. Seeding and gardening care. So these three. The planning, I think you already discussed last in the last webinar. When you talk about indoor seeding, so that's very much a planning. Uh, so we, today we'll focus on soil preparation, uh, seeding, and gardening care. There are three topics that we'll be talking today. So let's go on. Soil preparation. Here we have students, as Adi invited at the very beginning to, to think how you feel holding the soil. Well, well, here students are straight on the soil, feeling and they really enjoy a lot working in the soil. So before we, we move on, we, I would like to make clear the kind of soil that we work. There are two types of soil in nature. We have one is inorganic which is, we are very much familiar, is composed of minerals and organic matter, air and water. And then, as part of the natural soil, also we have organic soil, and that is the peat moss that we use either for, um, as, well, use for cooking, or nowadays we use for, for as a substrate for seed starting. So that is, and then we have the organic, organic that is factory made, human made. So it means that we have compost, we have a cow, a rotted manure, we have a mushroom manure, and we mix all together with sand, and that is the type of soil that we use in the gardens. So we don't use a natural soil, we use a man-made soil or human-made soil. And that these two soils are completely different, they behave differently, and we should treat them differently. All right, so as I say, we are growing food in a soil blend, 
and this allows us to grow these beautiful and nutritious vegetables. And everybody in the, at school, we really want to have these nutritious vegetables and see that with the students, cultivate with the students. All right, uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, this soil is rich in organic matter. Uh, commercial soils have between 70 and 80% of organic matter and 20 to 30% of sand, all right? So because of the amount of organic matter, this soil is an ecosystem for all the bacteria, fungi, and invertebrates that continue decomposing the organic matter constantly. There's no stop. And the more we water, the temperature in summer increases, we are that organic matter keeps and keeps decomposing. And then what happens is during after the summer, you will see that the level of your soil will go down. And then you have one option is you start adding fresh soil, fresh compost, or you just wait for the next spring to add a new compost. But what happens if you don't add an amender or fresh compost? Well, what you are left in that soil is just sand. And here to your left, have a picture of what happened with one of my garden beds. And there is a video that I as well uploaded to Wicklet, is when my soil got all the organic, the top six centimeters of organic matter was decomposed by the uh, soil fauna. And I was left with just sand. And when I went to water, well, the soil was so dry and became hydrophobic. So that was difficult to water. So it was quite hard, to, but was time consuming and lots of water in order to rehydrate the soil. So one of the things when we work with, with soil in the gardens is to keep feeding the soil with fresh organic matter. Um, at least each two years, you should add fresh compost just in order to prevent that the soil becomes sandy. And when we add organic matter, we'll be talking later, we have to choose a right blend. So um, let's move on to soil preparation. So as I said, we are assuming that we are working with um, human-made soil, and this soil has different characteristics. So from the start, the soil is rich in organic matter, is light is lots of pores lot for air and water to stay there so the first thing that we have to do is to till in the right season so we never till when the we till at the beginning of the spring now march or, or september when we came back from from summer break or we till um, at the end of june before going to summer break so we always try to till prepare the soil before the season starts so, it, um, so we never till the soil when it's frozen. So I know uh, if you have an open garden bed, it means that the, the garden bed hasn't been protected with hoop houses or cold frames. Uh, you feel with this wood weather, you feel like uh, it's time to start preparing the soil, but the soil is frozen. Well, that you are kind of destroying the, a small habitat is in there for the um, soil uh, microorganisms that are living in there. Um, other thing that we should consider is not under, underestimate the job. Um, I work with garden beds with gardens that have 15 to 16 garden beds. Uh, so they are large gardens and each garden bed is four foot by eight foot. So yeah, after five beds, I, I start feeling the, 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 my back. So it starts slowly. And if you are working with students, take your time, don't, work, don't plan to work all, the, all your garden beds at once. Um, when we work with the garden beds, we also choose the right tool. Uh, um, part of the garden tools should be a spading fork. Uh, that is, is not for digging, it's just for pinching the soil, forking, and back and forth uh, movement. So just to let air go in, into the soil. So that is the, the way we work, just like a spading fork. And, we not we are methodical. We usually try to use the leverage because the uh, action, uh, the the shape of the fork itself allows us to start from the middle of the garden bed 
and we work uh, towards the edge of the garden bed. So in that way, we go from one side, and the children go from the other side, and we loosen the soil that way, rather than trying to uh, start from from front to back. But I usually go through the long sides of the garden bed. It's easier. And never ever we try to bring the soil from the bottom of the garden bed to the surface. Uh, as I said, there are different levels of the soil. Uh, my, microorganisms are at different levels. So the ones that are at the very bottom, they are like to be there. It's cold, it's dark. And the moment you bring those microorganisms on the top, it's just you're exposing to conditions they are not used to, and most likely they will die. OK, let's see. Oh, here. All right. So as I mentioned, when we need to amend our soil, we have to be careful what we are adding. OK, so I, I want to as well to use to start thinking in circular economy. Everybody now is moving from sustainability to generative thinking. And now we're also moving from garden waste, which you usually say is garden waste. What we do eating is a garden waste. It goes to the compost. Rather than talking about the garden waste, now we are talking about resources. Whatever the garden we don't consume from the garden is a resource for something else. In this case, all the garden trimmings, no garden waste anymore. Garden trimmings becomes a resource for making compost. So we can use all these garden trimmings in a raw format. It means that it, everything is green, like a grass trim, and that we can add to our uh, soil. Usually we do in the spring if you have covered crops. Means you planted in for winter, you planted clover or grass, and for the spring you just mix it all together into the soil. You work that into the soil. So to um to add um, nutrients, but we have to be careful with that because uh, organ these road trims are rich in sugars, and therefore bacteria will develop very quick, and temperature might rise. The temperature of the soil rises, and if you have crops or seeds just planted, they could be that they, they are um, killed. So we have to be careful with that with raw materials. The one. The most common is mature organic uh, um, uh, compost, either rotten manure, rotten manure, well covered, decompost, garden compost, leaf mold, and these are just quite good. And as long as they are well rotten, uh, mature, you can add to your garden, work into the soil, and plant immediately. So you don't have to worry about that. One of the things that don't decompose very quick is any anything that has cellulose uh, and their favorite material like uh, wood chips we have lots of wood chips in the playground particularly in those areas where the children, children can fall like around the swings and somehow those wood chips make their way to the garden so i have lots of experience piles of wood chips in the garden on the garden beds and i had to just clean all these wood chips and bring it back because I I, honestly, I don't like having wood chips because, as well, in these wood chips, uh, fungus and bacteria grows and attracts uh, insects that like to eat uh, wood debris, such as the, as, uh, the roly polies that, and or wood lice. So, uh, and sometimes when, when these are accessible, those insects become a pest for our crops. So, try to keep a balance, not to bring too much fabric material. And the next is we something that we don't consider about because we are talking about organic matter, a soil rich in organic matter, and we think that this soil has all the nutrients for our plants. Yes, it has, but unfortunately it lacks micronutrients. In particular, we have problems with calcium. One is other. So we need to now and then add lime, agricultural lime to our soil, and so we can add some calcium so the plants take some calcium because they, they need that. I have experience with uh, some gardeners bringing eggshells. So you collect all lots of eggshells and then you crush it and they sprinkle over the garden. And in 15 days, I notice those eggshells are gone. And I've been thinking why 
the eggshell decomposes so fast. Well, it shouldn't. It's calcium. And so why is this appearing? And the fact is that calcium is also needed by birds. And the birds come and take calcium because in the spring as well they are nesting and they need calcium for their own eggs. And if you have calcium <laughs> around, well, they will come and take it. So it's better if you want to apply your, your eggs, crush them, use a, a moisture to make it to a grounded, grounded, and then you sprinkle into your soil and mix it. The other thing that we also use is Epsom salts. That's quite good because it adds magnesium and sulfur for the health of our crops. And one thing that you will notice is that you've been cultivating zucchinis for a few years. At one point, the zucchini plant starts fruiting, and at the end, where the flower is, you will see that the star dying becomes yellow and then becomes black, and suddenly you tiny little zucchinis start dying. And you're wondering why it's all about that. What, what disease is that? Well, it's not a disease. It is a physiological way that the plant tells us that it needs, calcium, uh, needs magnesium. So that's why the Epsom salt comes handy. Just add a tablespoon in there and mix it as well into the, into the soil. And that will help you with micronutrients. And then, I think that's I have all for this section. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, is, that, is there any question? Yeah. I want. I was wondering the same. If anybody has a question that want to post on the chat box or or ask directly to Pablo, you have to unmute yourself if you have a question. Nobody? Because I have a question, Pablo, in regard to the eggshells. Uh, when is the time in the oh. yep. planting cycle, uh, the, 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 the right time to put the, the eggshells or the Epsom salt to, in the soil? OK, so we will add the eggshells at any time and the epsom salts as well at any time you can add around your little plant just sprinkle and mix it and mix it no on so the top yeah uh, this top this base dressing is at any time yeah on the top but you have to mix it yeah ah okay i see that there is a question about here double digging method uh yeah i don't have experience with double digging uh because i use garden beds uh, in garden beds, uh, we, as I mentioned, we don't use natural soil, we use man-made soil. And so the double digging doesn't work. Double digging works very well in, in ground garden beds. So if you have a garden bed that is framed, but is sitting on the ground, and in that case, you are using uh, um, natural soil, rich in minerals, clay, silt, and, and sand. And of course, you will have added some compost. And so it's a mix of natural salt plus organic matter. And uh, yeah, I haven't experienced with double digging. Pablo, I have another question about adding compost to the soil. Um, All right. I think do you we... find like you just, I don't know if you talk about it later. I can't remember. <laughs> um, if you like just top dress soil or compost on the garden beds, or do you mix it in a little bit? Or how do you kind of replenish like in the spring? And if you weed, like, what is the first thing that teachers need to do when they go back to their beds now? Okay, so the first thing will be removing any weed, and then you will add a compost on top, and then you will certainly will mix it. Yeah, you, you, it's better to mix it. And... Um, there is there is a technique called uh, um, a zero waste tilling or zero tilling, yeah, zero tilling, and that that uh, uh, way to garden is that you just, just add fresh compost on top of the soil, the existing soil, and you plant in that fresh compost. So as well, you can go through that uh, that uh, technique. That means that you just leave the soil as it is with it. Leave, that, leave it as it is. So don't tilling at all, zero tilling. You add fresh compost and you, 
you plant your seeds in that fresh compost. So that it will be one all day. But what I usually do is, as I say, at the end of the season, I always end up with at least one centimeter of sand because all the running matter has been decomposed. So I just uh, come fresh compost in spring and mix it all together. I hope this, uh, this answers your question. Thank yes. you. I think that we can move forward, Pablo. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, so let's move on to the seeding and planting. Okay. See, I, I saw a question about what is a square foot garden. So we are going to talk about that in this section. So seeding and planting, so we have nice, mix the soil, the soil is red, it's crumbly, it's fluffy, it's chocolate brown, uh, it's crumbly as a chocolate cake, as I explained to my students, and now it's going to plant. So here is where you, way of gardening as a gardener, um, or garden champion at the school, or garden coordinator comes and shows in the garden, comes up and shows. So we are used to have, I remember at the beginning, I asked which kind of garden you are. So if you are fully organic, you will go and start with the seeds, uh, selecting the seeds. I uh, want open pollinated seeds. I uh, like to have heirlooms or heritage seeds. Uh, you be willing to consider hybrid seeds. Um, you own your own seeds from the previous season and you want to use because you know the procedence, you, you, the origin, I'm sorry. You know the origin of those seeds. Or if you are willing to go and buy, uh, you certainly would like to have organic certified. And then are you going to plant raw seeds? It means just seeds without any treatment. Or you want to plant seeds that have been pelleted, means they have a coating of clay or corn flour around the seeds just to make the seeds a bit bigger. This works very well with um, lettuce, lettuce and carrots. You will see the lettuce and carrots handle, they are so tiny. So they, they are comp uh, seed companies that they coat those seeds with clay or other materials that decompose very quick and uh, they are called pellets. Certainly these seeds are a bit expensive than the, than the raw seeds. All right, so uh, one of the things that we gardeners must excel is learning to read seed packages. And um, sometimes we even forget about that because we're in a hurry and we just need seeds because we have the gardening with the, with the children at the school. And then we just are guided by the lovely picture that the seed pack, seed, seed pack shows you, and we just forget about reading. So. One thing that I always try to remind myself is read, even if I had to spend extra minutes in the garden center, read. And one of the things that I really encourage you to read is packet four, which year the seeds were prepared for. So in this example I have here in the screen, if you see to the bottom, at the bottom right side corner, bottom right hand corner, it says it was packed for 2021. So I know that seeds, if you, you are careful, if you are stored very well, those seeds can last you for three years. But if there is no date, uh, I don't know how, how old the seeds are. And now at this time in here in spring, we have seeds being sold everywhere, even in the dollar store, uh, super store, um, supermarkets, uh, garden, uh, garden centers and hardware stores. And so first thing, check for which year the seeds were packed. If there is no year, well, think twice because those seeds can be old. Um, the next is days to maturity. This is very important because we are dealing with the school gardens and we have a very short period of time to grow vegetables. Um, we, we start in, in March and we end up in June. So in that, in that, small, in that short time, we need to at least to have one or two harvests. So we need to make sure that radishes is one of the favorites. And here is spinach, you can see again at the bottom, it says 43 days ready to harvest, but it's an F1, it means it's a hybrid. So if you are into all organic, well, perhaps this is not the kind of seed that you will 
we consider in using. But from my perspective is I want that the children, before the, the summer break, they already have one or two harvests. So that really shows that uh, it's kind of reward. Harvesting is a very much rewarding activity and, and the students feel like whatever they have done, preparing the soil, mixing the compost in there, seeding and planting at the end, they are rewarded harvesting. So days to maturity, very important. The other thing is when to plant. And that is the other thing that we sometimes on the hurry we forget. When we are in hurry doing in a hurry picking up seeds, we forget. Here you can see that the spinach is wood, it grow very nice if it's planted in mid-March to May. And again, between mid August and September. So in the cold season. But if you want to plant these seeds at the end of, at the beginning of June, well, the seed will germinate and two, three weeks later, it will bolt. And you are wondering why the, my plant is bolting, why the plant went into flower. Uh, it's simple because it's, this plant is used to having cold weather. Now it's so hot and summery that the plant says, oh, it's time to make seeds and start flowering. So when to plant is very important. And the other thing is the number of seeds. It's, that's very, very important to have our knowledge. Uh, for instance, this spinach packet has 290 seeds. And depending on the way you grow, well, you can say that, oh, this packet of seeds will be good enough for, from according to my approach of gardening, six, seven garden beds. So, oh, again, I don't have to spend too much money buying seeds. So I know that if I treat with care my seeds, uh, I know that I will, I will stretch how much I can plant. All right, so here, if you recall at the beginning, I asked you which kind of gardener you are. So if you are a traditional row gardener, that is the way we do. We make some drills, and in that drill, we sprinkle seeds. And then we cover, and what the packet says at the back, says why well, you have to, to think after a certain period. And if you don't do it, and which most of the times I as a garden don't do it. And then when we are at the schools with 15 garden beds, thinning all those garden beds is lots of time. So you just say, okay, yeah, let it grow. So in this picture you have in here, if you start from the left-hand side, you can see this gardener have take the time to plant their carrots a certain distance. So the carrots are nice planted. There's lots of distance, no thinning needed. And the next, followed by a row of radishes. Again, very nice, not much thinning to be done. But it seems the patience went run out. And when it was time to plant the leaf lettuce, it just sprinkled. Now, if you also remember the lettuce have tiny seeds, you just sprinkle. So it goes sprinkle, 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 sprinkle. The whole packet of seeds could be 300, 400 seeds are in here. And then at the top row, you can see there's a row of kale. <laughs> Just a sprinkle and then a bit of the picture cut off by the, is more kale and whatever was left from the uh, um, butter crunch lettuces. So again, that, that when you want to be patient and put at the right distance, you run out of, of patience at the end. So that is a traditional way of, of, of growing. The, the other way that I, I am the gardener is, I'm familiar with, is the square foot gardening. So somebody made a question about uh, what is the square foot gardening. Okay, so the square foot gardening is a gardening approach uh, in which you divide or you split your garden bed in one square foot, means one, by one foot, one foot by one foot squares. And in that square, you plant a certain number of seeds uh, depending the size of the plant. All right, so it, everything has been calculated for us. This garden style was developed in 1975. As I said, this garden method was developed in 1975 by a retired engineer, so it's quite <laughs> for that 
uh, organized way of thinking. So um, it works very nice in gardening. So I'm quite uh, familiar with this, and because it's also easy to teach in the schools with the children, it's very easy to, to teach. So let's Pablo, start here at the bottom in the orange corner. Pablo, excuse me, the Listening. interruption. We have eight minutes, seven minutes uh, left before going to the question, the Q&A section. Okay. Thank you. Hey, oof. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, this uh, seeding is uh, seeding is plant is, is square foot gardening. Uh, it, it start with la extra large plants like a cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower. One plant per square. Then we move for for large large uh, plants. The blue one, the blue square. Uh, only four plants. Then we move to the medium sized plants like a beets, a bok choy, celery, mustard. Nine plants per square, and these tiny plants, the small plants, like a radish, beet, carrots, 16 in a square. So that allows me to stretch my seeds. If you usually plant two seeds per spot, so um, we don't have to do any thinning. And also, if one of the seeds doesn't germinate, we use a backup always. So this is the an approach. I think I have added in my handout, there is a list a spacing planting so if you're interested in using this method you can just go in there and see how many carrots how many radishes how many bok choy is going on the square and and there are tools here at the top we have the seeding square that is a tool that you can buy in gardening centers nowadays and use as a template or just use as the the, the manual of this of this tool says to use and it's easy to do with the students So here I have our students being directed using the square foot garden. Um, now, as well, at this time we are thinking, OK, um, how am I going to plant? I'm going to plant from seeds. I'm going to use seedlings, or I'm going to use bulbs and roots. So here, again, some plants can be seeded directly. Uh, some of them, as well, can be planted indoors for transplanting. I personally. Personally, I seed everything indoors and move it outdoors. It's easier for the students, give them a plant and you put in the soil and you have an immediate effect of the garden. So you just with it, amend it and planted seedlings and the garden is looking great and ready to continue growing. So that way you don't have to spend much time growing indoors. Of course, we do indoors by ourselves. Otherwise, if you buy it, it will be so expensive. When you're doing your planting, as well comes the companion planting idea in our minds. And with the square foot garden, is interesting because I now I have this square, carrots, and what I will put the next to the carrots. Uh, so um, what works with carrots? Uh, alliums, uh, I'm sorry, onions will work, um, but no peas. So I will put uh, cabbages. Uh, uh, lettuces, tomatoes will work very nice with that. So I, again, in the handout, you have a list of all the companion planting. So it's just trying to one square and to run the in with nice neighbors. Um, yeah, so what we very much use in agriculture is crop rotation. Uh, but that in a school setting is rather difficult to bring it because a crop rotation is plant either three or five five years and so it means that in this section of the garden i planted peas and after five years i will plant peas again but if you have garden beds and each garden bed is assigned to a division and each division wants peas each division wants carrots each one wants <laughs> corn uh, and so it's quite difficult to to handle this crop rotation therefore i have a scale down and what i call crop succession so i plant Planted now something, I harvest and I will plant something different. So that is what this chart, this diagram is in here. If I have planted leaves, lettuces, uh, um, a pak choy, a Swiss chart, I harvest that and the next good uh, crop will be uh, peas or beans. If I harvest beans, then it will be roots. And if I harvest radishes or carrots, I will follow with cucumbers. 
numbers or eggplants or papers. So you can use this. Again, this diagram is in your handout. And I think we are almost there. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, since we are running out of time, the plant care, very much important, is watering. Um, the things that I will encourage is you water the soil, not the plant. Although sometimes we say, let's go and water the plant. No, we, we water the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some crops like um, all the gourds, cabbage, uh, um, sorry, um, zucchinis, pumpkins, um, they don't like water on the leaves. E even the beans, the beans, if you add, spray the leaves with water, they won't flower. So it's kind of, um, you have to be careful. So water the soil and not the leaves. And as well, in the handout, you will find, find a list where is the best way, the time, the best time or the critical time that you should water your crops. So for instance, bean, peas and potatoes and corn, when they are in flower, that is the time you should not miss a water. Or when the squashes and tomatoes are in fruit, when just you see the tiny fruits forming, should them stop watering. So, uh, so keep watering during that time that the fruit is forming. And yeah, there is some plants that are always thirsty, like beans, beets, peas, carrots. They, yeah, you need to try to gather all together them so you can water frequently. And when you need to water, for instance, in summer, I visit the garden twice a week. So I water on Tuesdays and Fridays, uh, uh, making sure that the weekend, when I'm at home relaxing, the garden is well watered and I don't have to work. So nowadays, with having this self watering garden beds, it's much easier because you just make sure that the reservoir at the bottom of the garden bed is full of water and uh, you check that now and then, or at least once a week to see if you need to top that. Um, finally, we have the plant care. Uh, yeah, the plant, the pest management. Again, in the handout, there is a list of what, um, what you can do if you have too many aphids. And here is the most important, be a good janitor, garden janitor. Remove anything that doesn't belong. Weed as well, your pads. You try to keep clean all the area. Um, what to do if you find, um, in this case, in this picture, I call this cabbage butterflies, the eggs, all this library. I, although I've been checking all, almost every week, um, they managed to eat all the crops. And uh, I got like a 20, 20 are here in my hands. And yeah, so, so my crop was gone. My radishes were gone, um, thanks to these little insects. So the, what I did is just remove everything and plant again. So once, what, what I do with these insects, uh, well, I can put in the compost if I want, or I just put in a bucket with soapy, uh, soap, uh, with soapy water and let them just drown in there. So yeah, there are some things that you have to be very harsh, particularly when you are dealing with aphids. Uh, if you are trimming plants that are completely covered with aphids, just don't dump this in the composter. Don't put this for the city to come and pick it up. It's better to do it to sink them to in a container with soapy water, so to ensure that the aphids will die before disposing. Uh, otherwise, the eggs and larvae uh, will be everywhere. Um, I, yeah, there are lots of organic products that you can buy nowadays in the market, uh, as well as in the handout. And yeah, let's try to encourage the friend, friend uh, insects in the garden, and hopefully they will take care of the, of the insects. And I think that's that's all for today. Uh, all I have for sharing with you today, guys. If you have any question, I'm I'm happy to to share uh, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. There are so so much information in your presentation, a brief presentation. Um, Joy ask. Um, it says. Sorry, I miss it. Where do we get the hand out? Yeah, if you can provide here with the weeklet uh, link. Okay. Oh, yes, I think that um, Ari um, shared it here in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so Joy should refer to the booklet. Pablo? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, so the okay, yeah, Joy got it. Okay. And anybody has some other question? No more questions. You can share them in the chat box or All right. say Great. directly to the, Pablo. The yeah. No more questions. I have a question, Pablo, while we wait for people to type. Uh, what is your favorite thing to grow with kids? What's your favorite crop? Mm, my favorite things to grow are, uh, at this moment, butter crunch lettuce, uh, beet, radishes, carrots, uh, snap peas, um, I'm no fan of the Swiss chart, I must admit, is because of the taste of dirt, um, kale either, so my gardeners almost have very little kale and very little um, Swiss chard, uh, I like Asian greens, pak choy, bok choy, mesklums, and um, uh, arugula. Um, sometimes I, 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 as well, I plant the wild arugula because that is a perennia, and so and it's very spicy and peppery. So those are kind of my favorites at the moment. And for summer, uh, cabbage and broccoli. Certainly. And for summer, tomatoes. I tried eggplants, but it's too long. I was harvesting by September, so I decided not to do it. And uh, New Zealand spinach. And cilantro, of course, <laughs> we love cilantro, and uh, um, spring onions or bourbon onions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, has... zucchini certainly zucchini. Sorry, Anna has a question. What is your favorite compost plant, um, and do you yes, make it my... yourself? <laughs> um. No, I, I don't make my own compost blend. Um, um, I buy it uh, from one of the uh, commercial companies here in Vancouver. And so again, the links of those companies are in the in the in, in the handout. Um, yeah, what I try to avoid is bringing any soil that has sand on it. So if I'm doing my soil already is, uh, as I said, has sand on it, 20 to 30 percent of sand. I don't want to bring more soil with sand, so I just focus myself either bringing um, um, rotting manure, if you want to use, or just soil amender, which is a mix of rotting manure, a mushroom manure, and compost all together. But it's commercial. So um, yeah, I, I don't blend my own. OK, thank you. Any other question? Okay, compost tea. Oh, yeah, this is what are my thoughts about compost tea. Oh, yes, great. Um, at the moment I have in the garden um, one composter called Aerobing. Uh, that is, um, you just put all your trimmings in there, your garden trimmings, and these composters decompose, and all the, the leaching, all the, the nutrients, the liquid nutrients are drained, and those can be collected. So. Uh, yes, I'm very fan of using compost tea. I'll collect those and add it to my dilute a bit and add to the garden beds. As well, I have my vermi compost, a box with worms, and as well, I collect all the liquids that come from this, the process of the composition. And again, I dilute a bit and add it to the garden bed. So, yeah, I'm very fan of the garden tea. And yeah. Okay. 
That was so in depth. I love the detail. Thank you so much, Pablo. That was really, uh, it's nice to get some like hands on knowledge, not just kind of vague information. It was really specific. So thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, and I think that we are ready to to hear some announcement from you, Adi. Awesome. Um, Pablo, if you don't mind, stop sharing your screen and then I can, I can just, oh, out. Sure. thank you. Oops. Oops. You got to do with a baby. <laughs> um, thank you everybody so much for coming. We really um, are so happy to have you here. And I just want to let you know, we have our next webinar scheduled for uh, Tuesday, April 13th. It's the same time, 3.30 to 4.30. Um, and it's about how to conduct a waste audit at your school. Um, and it's a pretty hands-on um, session as well for how to do this in your classroom. So targeted at teachers um, and educators who are working in schools. And this is from our um, Kamloops um, reading. I'm so excited. <laughs> And then as always, you can please uh, visit our website if you have any other questions. We have all of our animators uh, and their regional listservs there. We have a newsletter that you can sign up for and follow us on social media. We have lots of um, information that we share on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. Thank you so much. And uh, again, you will be all receiving a copy of the uh, recording, uh, slides, and uh, Pablo's wakelet um link if you didn't get it from the chat so thank you so much thank you so much everybody and thank you Adi and Adi's baby